we're finding, in fact, I don't think we found a scallop yet that does not have some wow. plastics in their gut. Wow. So I've seen a couple of samples with a thousand particles. That really? was in shock. I thought it was contamination. With, with a system as complicated as all these bacteria in the human mouth, if you do that, if you image just sort of right. random field of view, you're going to get a random result. If you've never seen a bear before, or a whale before, it's terrifying. I mean, and in fact, you can, you know, it's terrifying, but, but, I mean, when you see a whale, you find it fascinating. But you can imagine that if you've never seen, if you've never seen an animal larger than yourself, it would certainly be terrifying. Yet, certainly, there are a lot of people who find the whole concept of genome sequencing quite frightening, frightening, frightening because, uh, you know, what what if I what what, what if I um, take a little bit of saliva off of your fork and sequence your genome, and I know more about you than you do? The vast volumes of data in used in econometric modeling or, or weather forecasting or, or, or genomics or all kinds of other areas. So scale really is a huge issue. In DNA sequencing, the amount of data that you get has gone up so... We have something like 198,000 <laughs> DNA sequences per sample times 54 samples. So we have, Dude, we have about 10 million DNA sequences in our <laughs> file. What's frustrating is that it takes a long time to to really nail down any particular result. You can't necessarily see exactly what you're doing. You can just see the code that you ran. Oh. And it's running on a remote computer. <laughs> and I didn't know, like, could it run for another one day, another week? Yeah, there's so much information in an image. Like you're trying to implant an image of what you understand of the world to someone else. That's just a way for us to translate what you see. And so, when I put together these movies, you know, this is the rendered data. I try to use elements that help people contextualize what they're seeing, even though it's, you know, I can make this red blood cell membrane green or blue or purple, but it's the red blood cell, so we make it red. Um, I can make our parasite plasma membrane, so that's what's here in tan, because that's what you think about when you think about the membrane. In the middle of this membrane rupture, so you have the red blood cell membrane down here, and then you have, this is called the parasitophorus vacuolar membrane around here. And so we can actually see that it's right in the middle of membrane rupture, and membrane rupture, and membrane rupture, and membrane rupture, and membrane rupture. And membrane rupture. One thing that we study within the lab is the release of daughter merozoites. So these are daughter cells of the parasite from the red blood cell. Mm -hmm. So the O here is a red blood cell that's rupturing and releasing parasites. We could just start the movie, and I could show you everything and spin it around, but it's really hard to get a grasp of what's actually happening. Into what we can understand and knowing that that's not the reality, but our interpretation. To figure out where you might be being deceived by the data <laughs> and, and think of controls that can, that can help you be sure that what you're seeing is real, right? to something unless you also know that it's there. So you can get the wrong answer. So, uh, our first task is to figure out which, wh what is reality. Right. And, uh, and then address the, the real specific science goals. So a lot of um, developing the procedure is, is developing the controls that give you confidence that the answer is right. You have to be really always alert for <laughs> ways that the data could be telling you something that's not actually true. Right. You can see an interesting phenomenon and you can think that there's probably something interesting there, but to really prove it is going to take a lot of time and a lot of You just see wow. just right away say, wow, look at that. You, know, yeah. you, you just can see right away that there's a lot of information there and that the bacteria are doing something structured relative to each other. So right. that makes it really right. interesting. Let's see. Wow. <laughs> How does it feel to see your mouth?
and says it too. When we wanted to apply it to real bacterial communities, we started with the mouth, the human mouth. It turned out also to have all sorts of amazing yeah. spatial structure, as, as you can see. Right. This imaging is much slower, so it's looking at the same community, but in a much more low throughput way. Low throughput is we have to sit here, pick a field of view, focus on it, you know, get, adjust the microscopy settings, get the picture, right? right? Yeah. All I can do is go in and see, you know, we can see that there's a right. hundred different blobs on the slide and we have time to take right. pictures of five of them. Even just when you first look in the microscope and you see these little glowing, right. glowing objects. Almost all of it is your human intuition guiding the computer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wonder what, what's in someone's mouth. Actually, I know what's in someone's mouth. <laughs> I wonder what, what's in someone's mouth. Actually, I know what's in someone's mouth. <laughs> so, yeah, so as we're moving through the data, you're seeing this parasite. Um, and it can be hard for us to, you know, even for me, if you're moving through and you're trying to count. We really need to know where the plastics are. It's not at the surface, it's someplace else. They're probably scattered through the uh, midwater. On average, plastics are pretty rare. You know, it's, it's kind of a needle in the haystack. So that's to simulate wave activity on a beach or out in the middle of the ocean. Eventually, all plastics will become contaminated with algae and bacteria. They become uh, colonized. It's no longer a piece of plastic. It's biological. So very small organisms that are feeding on these plastic particles uh, are then eaten by a suspension feeder like mm -hmm. a copepod, mm -hmm. and a copepod kind of gets eaten by a fish, and all the plastics in its gut just keeps transferring up the food right. chain right. and magnified to the point where now the fish is loaded with plastics. One of the projects I'm working on is looking at uh, microplastics that are taken up by sea scallops and then analyzing different tissues, uh, the, the gut uh, and the, uh, the gonad, the meat, the the, uh, the velum around the outside mm -hmm. um, to see if, first of all, are plastics taken up, and if they are taken up, are they transported to different tissues uh, in a way that uh, perhaps you know humans would be exposed to them? This is extraction. So these are cow cuts. Cow cuts. You have to have a method to extract the particles mm -hmm. from the tissues. We use uh, very strong bases or strong acid that uh, digests the material. It leaves kind of a gooey residue, diatomaceous ooze. What is reality?